Today, we're back on our Wrangler Unlimited to upgrade the stock axles with lower gears, locking differentials, and upgraded axle shafts. Then, we're adding a slip yoke eliminator kit to the transfer case. It's all today, here on Trucks. Hey guys, welcome to Trucks. Well, we're back at work on our Jeep Wrangler Unlimited, taking what's already a solid platform from the factory and improving it. Last time you saw us work on this Jeep, we installed a Rusty's long arm lift kit, belly pan, extended shocks, springs, brake lines, as well as a cool looking Mickey Thompson wheel and tire package that's gonna give us better functionality and off-road traction. But we're not done yet, and we had a little bit of a chance to work on this thing between shows. Now to protect our vulnerable steering box, we've added a skid plate as well as a steering box brace that ties it into the passenger side frame rail. That'll reduce the stress that's placed on the box due to the larger wheels and tires and the leverage they have. We've also added some radiator protection and a heavy duty tie rod to replace the lightweight and kind of spindly stock piece. Check it out. Now this is the stock tie rod and it works fine for a small Jeep on stock size tires. But upon further inspection, well, it's clearly nothing more than a 7 8 diameter tube with about maybe a 3 16 wall thickness. Like we said, it works great for stock size tires, but you add bigger tires and this thing is prone to bending and failing. And that's the last thing you need when you're out on the trail and miles from civilization. We also had some time to install the Daystar Stinger bump stops that we showed you when we installed the lift kit. What we did was max out the suspension travel, figure out where we wanted to limit it, then unbolted the factory bump stop and welded the Stinger bump stop in its place. And as it is, with the suspension fully maxed out and compressed, the tires barely clear the fender flares. That's just what we want. Now the Dana 44 that came in this Jeep from the factory is actually pretty strong and can take a fair amount of abuse. However, we are upgrading to stronger aftermarket axle shafts. And this 44 is a non-C-clip semi-float axle, meaning you don't have to pull the diff cover to remove the C-clips to remove the shaft. You just have to remove the four bearing retainer bolts. Now, reinstalling them can be a little bit tricky. I found that if you put the nut on the end of a magnet, you can thread it on the first couple of threads and save your fingers in the process. Now, the rear rotors and green pads are from EBC. Now, the axle shafts we're installing are 10 factory shafts that we picked up from Rusty's. Now, they're the same overall length and spline count as the stock shafts, but there are a couple of differences. These are forged from a 1541H high manganese alloy, and they're heat treated, so they're plenty strong. They're also drilled and tapped for both five on four and a half and five on five and a half inch bolt patterns. We added a little bit of red Loctite to the wheel studs before we threaded them in. Now the axle kit comes with everything except for the bearing retainer plates. So we picked up a pair of those so we could have complete axle assemblies. In the unlikely event that you break an axle on the trail, you just swap in the whole axle assembly and move on. Now if you do happen to break one of these replacement axle shafts, don't worry, there's a 10 year warranty. And with the shafts installed, the ring and pinion setup, and the air locker plumbed, from the axle housing in anyway, we could reinstall the factory diff cover, once we put a layer of RTV in between the two. Now the cover looks new and shiny. It's because we sandblasted it to get rid of any rust and scale. Now I'm installing all the bolts for now until the RTV sets up. But then I'm gonna go back and remove the bottom five bolts so we can install our rusty diff cover skid. A little black paint just makes it look like new. Now the bottom half of the kind of thin stamped steel diff cover is what's most prone to damage. So our heavy duty skid will prevent us from tearing stuff up. Now up front, we've got an air locker as well. We've already got the ring and pinion set up, so we're not gonna bore you with too many of those details. We've got a good looking gear pattern, we've got the correct amount of bearing preload and the correct amount of ring and pinion backlash. So we're ready to move forward. And that means drilling and tapping this Dana 30 axle housing so we've got a way to activate the air locker. Now, if you've never done this before, it can seem a little bit intimidating. You know, drilling into an axle housing and all. But we just started with an eighth inch pilot hole followed by a 7 16 drill bit so we could use our eighth inch pipe tap. And we packed the flutes full of grease to keep too much debris from falling down in the axle housing. 
they'll just limit cleanup later. As you can see, the grease does a pretty good job of picking up a lot of the shavings. When you're ready to install your new fitting, don't forget the thread sealant. And you don't want to cross thread the threads either. You only get one chance at this, so just snug it down and leave the four foot breaker bar at home. And after routing the copper airline through the fitting, it gets sealed with an O-ring. Just make sure the O-ring seated before you install the second fitting. Now typically air lockers use this middle fitting followed by the blue plastic line, a compression nut, and this spring to keep the blue line from folding over on itself and kinking. But we've got something a little bit more heavy duty in mind. So we picked up these replacement fittings and stainless steel flex air lines from Crown Performance. They're much less prone to getting kinked, melting through, or just getting cut out on the trail. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, we've made some progress and we're ready to install some axle shafts. Now the air locker that we installed isn't your standard Dana 30 ARB. Stock differential has 27 splines. This upgraded unit has 30, meaning our axle shafts obviously also have 30 splines and a little bit larger diameter, making these 4340 chrome molly shafts from 10 Factory a great upgrade that will help us keep this front axle together under the extra stress of our 35 inch Mickey Thompsons. Now to keep mud, dirt, and debris from laying in the bottom of the axle tube, we're installing these outer tube seals. And that'll make sure the splines of the axle shaft don't get all gunked up with crap when you reinstall the axle shaft. Part of this upgrade includes larger inner axle seals as well. Now here's a tip for you guys that wheel these Jeeps with a Dana 30 unit bearing front axle. Now, if you happen to be out on the trail and break a front axle shaft, stock or otherwise, well, it's not simply a matter of removing the broken axle shaft pieces and reinstalling the unit bearing. This unit bearing actually relies on the stub axle to hold it together. If you simply reinstalled the unit bearing with no stub axle, well, you'd make it about 10 yards before this became a two-piece unit and you'd be in worse shape than you were moments earlier. So remember, if you experience this problem, always reinstall the stub axle. Or better yet, carry a unit bearing as a spare along with a nut and bolt that'll serve the same purpose. Now you DIY guys from the north already know that you've got to add a little bit of anti-seize or a lot of anti-seize to these unit bearing and steering knuckle connections. It doesn't take much corrosion to seize the unit bearing right to the knuckle. I've seen guys have to use blow torches and sledgehammers to remove these things. So a little anti-seize on the unit bearing and the threads of the bolts themselves go a long way in making sure this assembly can be disassembled. Now the next thing we're going to be doing is installing a heavy duty slip yoke eliminator kit into our NP231 transfer case here that came stock in our LJ. Now we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One, we want to switch over to a 1310 CV style yoke that will allow for a longer rear drive shaft and one we can dial any vibrations out of rather easily. We also want to increase the overall strength of our transfer case. Now if you've never taken apart or rebuilt a major drivetrain component before, a project like this is a great place to start. There's not too much going on inside this transfer case and the project itself is pretty straightforward. Essentially, what we're doing is replacing the main shaft with this much shorter and stronger replacement. And once you get the main shaft swapped out, well, it goes back together pretty much the way you took it apart. Now, having the case split apart like we have is a great time or opportunity to check for wear on the pads of the shift forks and for any other debris caught up in the oil pump screen. Now, ours was in great shape, as these typically are. To finish up the install, we installed the new tail shaft housing and 1310 CV yoke. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, so far today, we've had a chance to add air lockers to our 456 geared Dana 30 and 44 axles, as well as add a heavy duty slip yoke eliminator kit to our NP231 transfer case. Now, all we've got left to do to finish up those two installs is find a home for our ARB compressor and measure for a rear drive shaft but we want to get away from the drivetrain a little bit and pay attention to the exterior of that LJ. Now, since you can get just about any part that you need for a Jeep, 
from Rusty's? Well, we went back to him and picked up a pair of powder coated bumpers, a winch mounting plate, and an 8,500 pound winch, just in case we find ourselves in trouble. Now the original equipment bumpers, well, they're okay. They passed the DOT tests, but we can definitely do better. Kind of lightweight. Besides, the plastic filler panel between the bumper and the grill doesn't give us much opportunity to mount up a winch. Obvious benefits to the Rusty's bumpers are heavy duty construction and stubbier ends that aren't going to get folded back into the tires when we hit an obstacle. And the winch mounting plate works in concert with the bumper, conveniently bolting into the factory locations. And we're locking it into place with grade 8 hardware from Industrial Depot. Just like the front, the rear bumper doesn't offer a whole lot of protection to the body tub, especially with the plasticky balloon ends of the bumper. You got it? Yep. <laughs> the Rusty's rear bumper is a lot beefier, and because of the extra weight, it relies on a little bit more than the factory mounting locations. So we just measured off the back side of the bumper, transferred that measurement onto the cross member, and drilled. And drilled. And drilled. And drilled. And drilled some more. Now the Matco step drills really come into handy. You see us using these all the time. I highly recommend one for your toolbox. And a splash of Duplicolor stops the corrosion. This is much more substantial. I think my left hand is nothing but thumbs. I have five thumbs on my left hand. Funny, I was thinking the same thing about my right. Now, by swapping bumpers, we bought ourselves a lot more approach angle. But the internal receiver hitch really gives us a lot more clearance. Now, the front bumper is pre-drilled to install the factory driving lights, which we just transferred over from the other bumper and plugged back in. The last step in this project is installing the hook onto the winch cable, and don't forget your cotter pin. After that's complete, don't forget the pull strap so you don't pinch your fingers. You're watching Trucks. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Trucks collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. Hey, welcome back. Well, Trucks has been working with Woodward Fab for a long time. Woodward Fab has been making high quality but affordable metalworking tools since 1966. So it was a natural choice for us to call them up when we wanted to expand our little fabrication corner here. So check it out as we show you some of this gear and how easy it is to make some pretty complicated stuff in minutes. Now you can cut just about any sheet metal shape you want with these Matco hand shears, but for a straight, precise cut, this bench top shear is the ticket. Simple. But if you want to do something a little more complicated, this rotary shear is the ticket. It allows you to make complex curves, and the serrated top wheel guides the workpiece through the equipment. You could do a detailed cut. It's got a straight edge if you want to do a straight cut with an angle finder for precision. And by the way, this thing will cut up to 8th inch plate. That's pretty impressive. Now, forming metal with a bag and a mallet goes back to the Bronze Age, and it's a great way to get a roughed out shape on a piece of aluminum stock like we've got. Plus, it's great therapy. The bag is usually filled with lead shot or sand, and it conforms to the energy that's transferred from the mallet through the metal. So you can create your rough shape in a very short amount of time. And that's roughed out, ready for the wheel. Now that we've got our rough shape, we can take our lumpy, knobby piece of aluminum and refine the shape with the English wheel. Now, obviously, the aluminum bends easily, and you can see the results quickly. But if you're working with carbon steel or cold rolled, well, you're just going to have to work a little longer and a little harder. Now, obviously, the shape of the anvil corresponds with the shape of the workpiece that you're working with. And this is a slow process. If it's not fast enough for you, well, check this piece out. Now, a planishing hammer will flat out move some metal, and it operates on the same principle, which is a hammer and an anvil. In this case, it's a pneumatic air hammer, and we're going to use the most aggressive anvil that we've got, just to prove a point. Now, 
in seconds, we've got a nice little dimple there. So it's obvious what you can use is for shaping. You can make curves and contours and complex compound curves quickly. Now, if you've got a large piece of flat stock and you want a precision cut made, this foot shear with a 40-inch blade will get it done. We've got our fence set at a 6-inch cut at 90 degrees. Perfect cut, no distortion, all 10 fingers. Now, I know you've seen this metal brake used on trucks before. It's huge, and with the modular jaws, you can bend just about anything and get real creative with boxes and different shapes. Now, we've shown you how to make a 90-degree bend with C-clamps and a piece of 2 by 4 But imagine trying to do that 48 inches long. There's nothing quite like having the right piece of gear for the project. It just saves time. A shrinker stretcher is just what it sounds like. One set of jaws pulls the metal apart, creating the illusion of stretching. One set of jaws shrinks the metal or gathers it together, creating the illusion of shrinking. Now, this could be an engine cover, a fender, a battery box, whatever you want to design. And with a quick change of the jaws, we can see the possibilities open up. Heck, you could even make your own set of mini tubs, saving lots of time and lots of money. Now this bench top press has several different dies available, but by far the coolest one is the louver press. Now never mind the nostalgic hot rod aspects of this. Think about functional cooling inlet or exhaust ducts. So if you're thinking about bringing your fab shop to the next level like we did, check out woodwardfab.com. Sign up for their free catalog and you might be surprised just how affordable this gear is. So thanks for watching today's show. If you've got any questions over anything that you've seen, check us out on powerblocktv.com. See you next time.